Today we're going to begin our study of large signal response. We contrast this to small signal response, which is what we just completed. In small signal response, one of the key things we're interested in is the voltage gain. So we could say something like, well, we have a one millivolt input, we have a voltage gain of 100, we just multiply these together, and we get 100 millivolts. It's a nice linear relationship. I put in two millivolts, we get 200 millivolts out. We put in five millivolts, we get 500 millivolts out. Well, the question becomes, how far can we take this? If we put in one volt, will we get 100 volts out? Well, that would be unlikely, particularly if you had something like a 15 volt power supply. How could you do that? So the goal of our large signal analysis here is to see just how big the signal can get before we run into some kind of limit or distortion. Now, there are several different kinds of amplifier classes that we can make. The most straightforward is what's called a class A amplifier. And essentially, the amplifiers we've looked at so far are all class A amplifiers. What that means is that the collector current, the AC collector current, flows for 360 degrees out of the cycle. In other words, we have one transistor operating in linear region for 360 degrees. There are other kinds of classes. For example, a class B amplifier, which we'll look at soon enough, utilizes two transistors and they each flow for 180 degrees. In other words, one takes care of a positive half wave, the other takes care of a negative half wave. There's also class D amplifiers, which basically use the transistor as a switch. It's either fully on or fully off, saturation or cutoff. Those circuits are a bit more complicated. They do have the advantage of much higher efficiency than Class A, but Class A is a, a very simple sort of design. It's effective for small signal or low power, modest power sorts of uh, situations. So our goal here is to see just how big the output signal can be. We're not necessarily doing a high power calculation here, and we might be interested in and the uh, maximum signal swing out of a small signal amplifier. I still want to know how much we can get out voltage-wise into a following stage. Okay, So the big downfall of this, which eventually we'll see, is that the Class A amplifier has a theoretical maximum efficiency, if it's capacitively coupled, of only 25%. And practically speaking, it'll probably be a lot worse than that. So let's dive in. We'll start with a little AC equivalent circuit looking something like this. And here's our transistor. Now I'm going to be as generic as possible here and draw in an emitter resistance, an AC emitter resistance, as well as an AC collector resistance. Now, practically speaking, we'll probably have either one or the other. For example, if we had a voltage follower, which would be common for a power amplifier, <clears throat> excuse me, we'd only have the RE, the RC would be shorted. And if we had a common emitter amplifier, uh, there would be no RE if there was no swapping. And even if there was swapping, the RE would be a lot smaller than the RC. Otherwise, we wouldn't get much gain. So this is sort of a generic treatment and we'll create one equation for this and then when we go in we can either sort of short out the RC set zero or or the RE as, as uh, interesting. Now I would like to see what sort of range of currents and voltages that transistor is going to experience. So on this axis we have VCE and on this axis we have IC. Now we've already looked at DC load lines, so I'm just going to draw a DC load line over here, like this. Now we know there's one point on here of interest, of major interest, and that is the Q point. So I'm just going to arbitrarily kind of stick the Q point over here. We know there's an associated current for that, ICQ, and an associated voltage, VCEQ. Depending on where we bias this, depending on the uh, various resistors and power supplies and so forth, right? It could be up here. The Q point could be down here. But we'll arbitrarily we'll just stick it right there. So the question then becomes: 
Um, how is this modified in the AC case, right? What is the AC load line? That's what we want to dive into here because that's going to tell us just how much of a AC si signal swing we can get, okay? Now, as in the case of the DC load line, the slope of this line is dictated by the DC resistance in the collector emitter. The same thing is true in the AC case. Now, right now we can say that the AC load line must share at least one point with the DC load line, and that is the Q point. It would have to go through this point. The reason being, um, if you could imagine bringing the AC signal down to zero, it would collapse onto the Q point. So the AC resistance would have to be smaller than the DC resistance, and therefore we would expect to see uh, a greater slope, a steeper slope, for the AC load line. In other words, we might see something more along this line for our AC load line. Now there would still be endpoints on here. We would still have um, right over here an IC sat like we used to have for the DC, and there would of course be a cutoff voltage, right, a VCE cutoff at this endpoint. Okay. Well, our goal is going to be to find out, you know, what those particular values happen to be, because here's what's going to happen: as the input signal swings positive negative the instantaneous operating point is swinging along this blue line it's swinging along our AC load line so it swings up to a peak swings down to a peak and back and forth as the input signal goes okay now ultimately these things the IC sat and the VCE cutoff are going to determine just how large of an output signal swing we can arrive at so how do I come up with uh, value is at least an expression for uh, those two endpoints. Well, we come over here to our uh, little simplified circuit, and what we would know is that at the quiescent point there would be a voltage sitting across this transistor, which is VCEQ, and there would be a current flowing through here, which is ICQ. Okay? So as far as um, IC sat is concerned, right, as far as this value up here is concerned, we can see that's made up of two pieces on our load line. It's made up of this piece, which is ICQ, and then this second piece up here, ICQ up to IC sat. So what is this second piece? What is that extra value? Well, that's essentially dictated by this VCEQ. This is the voltage that we have on the transistor that's available, if you will, to drop across the AC collector and emitter resistance. So that represents a maximum additional current. And we can just use Ohm's law on that. That would just be VCEQ divided by the quantity RC plus RE. All right, so that dictates this point up here. And then down here for cutoff, we have a similar sort of situation. We have VCEQ as one part of it, and then we have the second piece, right, from VCEQ up to cutoff. So what is that? Well, again, I come back to my original circuit here. The extra voltage that we can get is dictated by ICQ and the sizes of these resistors again. So we have, once again, a little Ohm's Law relationship. We would just say, okay, that's equal to ICQ times the two resistor values, RC plus RE. Again, I want to reiterate that most likely one of these, RC or RE, is going to be zero in the average circuit. Okay, so let's um, sort of zoom in on this a little bit to see what's happening. So here's an expanded version of our AC load line. And I'm just going to sort of arbitrarily drop down a value for the Q point. We'll just say it's right there. Okay. So here's the ICQ value and here's the VCEQ value. Now, imagine we throw in a signal. Okay, so I have an AC signal. Now, what is, what is that AC signal going to do back here? Well, it's going to create an AC current, right? So I could imagine 
put a little axis out here. So I can imagine this signal swinging positive and negative. All right? Now at the same time, that is going to produce a variation in the VCE. So as this point swings up, right, that is going to produce a VCE variation like this. And then when it swings on the negative side, right, the Q point is going to swing down to here. So you can see what's happening here, right? That lines up. And then as this swings down, we can see the VCE is going like this. Okay? So basically, this is uh, reflecting what your uh, output voltage is going to look like. So as the input gets bigger, a bigger input, right, that's going to swing further, right, kind of like this, swing down to there, and we can see that the associated swing out here will be greater. Well, at some point, we're going to run out of room. Okay? At some point, this signal is going to get so large that it's not going to fit entirely on the load line. This will swing up to this peak, but it can't swing down to this peak. Right? There's nowhere else for it to go. It doesn't have any space out here. So what does the output signal look like? What's the VCE look like? Well, it's going to go like this. And then when it gets to this point out here, well, it's just mm, going to flatten and then we'll come back. So we have this sort of flat-topped kind of um, waveform. It wants to kind of come out like this, but we don't get that. Now, we call that, this effect, we call that clipping. Pretty obvious name, right? You're clipping the top or the bottom of the waveform off, you know, kind of like you had some kind of electronic scissors, okay? That's something we don't want to do. As a general rule, you don't want to clip a signal that creates very gross distortion. If you had a voice signal, for example, it would uh, make it very fuzzy and indistinct. If it was um, uh, music that you were listening to, the same sort of thing would happen. About the only time we would do that on purpose is for some kind of aesthetic effect. A good example of that would be um, a fuzz guitar sound for uh, you know, a rock tune. We would purposely overdrive an amplifier and those uh, um, added harmonics created by the clipping give the sound a certain characteristic, you know, we like that sound and off we go, right? But that's sort of the exception rather than the rule. All right, how do we avoid this? Well, you know, looking at this particular diagram, you could say, well, you know, it's, it's clipping on this end before it's clipping on this end, so what if we bring the Q point up here further? Right? Like maybe if I bring it up to here, would that be better? Well, yes and no. It depends on how far I bring it. If I bring it where I just drew this, it will help this bottom end, but what's going to happen is the top end is going to start clipping. So what we would see is our waveform over here. This end would get clipped, and then this end would be nice. Well, that doesn't really help you. I mean, it's, it's kind of like trying to run a marathon and your choice is to either break your left leg or your right leg. You know, either way, you're not going to go too far. Um, the best we can do here is to place the cue point right in the center. Right? If I can get it right in the center, we'll have maximum usage of that uh, load line. Okay? And we'll get the biggest possible signal. So in other words, I want these two halves and these two equations to be the same. Right? I'll want them to literally be halves. In other words, if we have a centered Q point, if the Q point is in the center, then it would have to be true that ICQ equals VCEQ divided by RC plus RE. Or if you prefer, you can look at it this way and say VCEQ would have to equal ICQ times the quantity RC plus RE, or you could even look at it as, you know, a, a, sort of a resistive relationship, right? You could say that um, VCEQ over ICQ would have to equal RC plus RE. Uh, of these three, I think this middle one is the most useful, as you will see. It's the most practical thing that we have to look at. Um, Basically, what this 
tells us um, is that if we, if we have a centered cue point, I can use the VCEQ as my peak signal swing. Now we call that the compliance of the amplifier. Okay, the compliance of the amplifier. Now that could be a peak value. It could be a peak to peak value. Very often we compute this as an RMS value because we want to do a power calculation. I would like to figure out what the power and the load is. So RMS is um, a very good one. We can basically say that the maximum load power that we can deliver in the amplifier will equal the RMS compliance squared divide by, divided by whatever our load resistor is. Okay, <clears throat> or load value, as it were. So that's what we're focusing on. Okay, well, what if the cue point isn't centered? Not every circuit has a centered cue point, especially if it's a, like an intermediate stage or something like that. It's not the final power stage. How do I calculate this? Well, looking at the diagram we have here, what we're really saying is, I would like to look at the smaller swing. In other words, here's the cue point. So which swing is smaller, from here to here or from here to here? Okay, in other words, we can swing from Q over to cutoff. We can swing from Q over to saturation. Which is the smaller swing? So looking at this, we can just say, okay, the smaller of these two sets the compliance, right? It sets the peak output swing, okay? So you can use that as a general uh, operative. Wherever the Q point is, look at this equation, figure out which one is smaller, that's the peak value. You could then uh, use your RMS um, fudge factor, if you will. VRMS is approximately equal to V peak times 0 0.707. Remember that's 1 over the square root of 2, right, times 0 0.0707. And you can uh, use that value then to calculate your power. All right? Okay. So that would be the uh, precise value if you had something like a follower. If you had a heavily swamped amplifier, common emitter amplifier, uh, there will be a small voltage divider effect between uh, the swapping resistor RE and RC. So properly speaking, you really should um, compensate for that, do a little voltage divider, and then use that slightly smaller voltage as your uh, peak value, and then you can you know, compute your uh, RMS value off of that. The other thing that we want, want to remember is that when we calculate load power, the key here is to use the load resistor, not the AC equivalent value, because the AC equivalent value includes the biasing resistor. So for example, if we had maybe a swamped amplifier, common emitter amplifier, something like this. I'm going to draw the whole thing, just part of it. I want to focus on the output end. All right, so here's my R load. And then we have, of course, you know, a biasing resistor, collector biasing resistor. Well, that combination is what gives you little RC. All right, that parallel combination is this. So I don't want to use this value in my power calculation because what I'll, what I'll wind up doing is calculating the power in both the true load and part of the amplifier, this biasing resistor. All right. Um, what I want to do is make sure that I use this value of our load, right? just to illustrate this. Suppose we had maybe a 20K ohm resistor for biasing and this was uh, you know, a small signal interstage amplifier, I'm feeding another stage, and this load value is the input impedance to the next stage, which is 10K. So we would say that the little RC is uh, 20K in parallel with 10K. That's a 2 to 1 ratio. So that will give us 2 thirds of the smaller value, which is 6.67K. Well, if you calculate your power at 6.67K, obviously you're going to get a bigger value than if you calculate it with the 10K. All right? So that would be a bit of a cheat. 
because you're not talking about power that's getting the load, you're talking about power that's in the load and in this biasing resistor. So that is one other thing to remember. All right, so to recap, what we do here is we calculate our AC load line, and we have two equations for that right here. All right. Most importantly is the second one, this one right here. And we want to basically look at these two pieces of it, VCEQ and ICQ times the collector emitter resistance. Whichever one is smaller, that will tell us essentially which side clips first, if you will. That sets the peak compliance. We can turn that into an RMS value and then use that RMS value to compute true load power, remembering to use the actual load resistance, not the AC equivalent. Okay? There you have it.